So you've been thinking about buying a used graphics card, or you've bought one recently, and with the very high probability that the GPU has been mined on despite what sellers will tell you, it brings into question, how do you tell if a graphics card has been mined on? And how can you determine if it's working the way that it should? Because even if you know some good benchmarks, some of the standard ways to test this can be a bit misleading. Some people may even be getting scores much higher than you are. So having bought dozens of used graphics cards over the years and a fresh new used GPU to do it again with you today, fresh new used GPU? Either way, follow along or know for the future. I'll talk you through what to do at each stage of testing and things that can help you if your card is failing. So let's cover the best way to determine if your GPU is happy and healthy or if it's limping its way to the grave. Let me explain. So it really should come as no surprise that I enjoy gaming like many of you guys, but one of the hardest things I find about gaming is actually meeting up with someone online and playing. Most of my friends are five hours in front and they're going to bed when I'm done with my day, which leads me to today's video sponsor, epal.gg. I honestly went into the service not really knowing what to expect, but I chose the games that I like to play through the easy to use navigation system and browse the marketplace of PALs. With so many free first orders, I ultimately ended up playing with Bunny Ella and Al Pro and had a fantastic experience with both of them. Ella was a great conversationalist and we enjoyed a variety of games together while Aldo Pro was, well, basically pro compared to me and helped me win almost all of our ranked matches. So if you want to meet up with some fun and engaging people online to improve your skills or just have some fun, check out the sponsor links in the video description. So firstly, we need to understand what we're looking for and why these signs might point to a dead or dying GPU but I do need to further clear up some misconceptions. Just because a GPU has been mined on doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad buy or it's on its way out. One of the biggest benefits of mining is that you're not thermal cycling the cart like you do with most other GPU related tasks. This is a big benefit as thermal cycling is most likely to crack the solder joints and render a card dead. But that doesn't mean that mining on a card is better than gaming. It just utilizes the card differently, decreasing the impact to certain components, but increasing the strain on others. Because a constant heat is being applied to it, the fans are normally running non-stop and commonly the first to go, typically much sooner than if a card was gaming. And excess heat related to mining is also a primary concern, especially for cards with clogged heat sinks or poorly designed thermal management systems for the memory, especially with GDDR6X cards like the 3070 Ti or better from Nvidia. However, you can pretty easily check most models stop memory junction temps while mining. And as long as they're below 95 degrees C for GDDR6 and 105 for GDDR6X, that is within spec. Although it is speculated that that's a conservative number. However, lower is still always better. So the thing that you have to remember is that if a card has been well looked after, that is likely going to be your biggest contributing factor as to whether it will last. More important than if a card has been mined on. Many other highly rated tech channels that cycle through more cards per year than most people will own in a lifetime have come to the same conclusion I have in my testing. And you can learn more about my latest experience of comparing two of the exact same GPUs, one of them mined on for 18 months and the other one that's strictly gamed and edited in this video. But ultimately, with everything else being equal, the performance of a GPU is linked to clock speed. And for everything else, we can inspect and torture test to bring issues to light. So let's do that now, starting with the easiest. Okay, so let me introduce you to the card that we've got that we'll be doing physical inspection, all the testing, everything on, which is the GTX 285. This is definitely for a different project. This is a flagship from 2013, I believe. So. Bear with me. This is the RTX 3080, specifically the Tough Gaming from Asus. A very good card, decent power delivery, boosts really high or it's meant to, but we'll figure that out in a bit for this specific one. Now I bought this card on eBay and like many of the other eBay listings, it said that it had never been mined on, only ever used for gaming. Now you really shouldn't believe that. It's far too easy for people to just not disclose things or misrepresent a product on eBay. But what we can do is a physical inspection, which is absolutely the first thing that you should be doing when you get your graphics card. See if there's anything wrong with it, anything amiss really. What we're looking for is fan conditions Condition, anything like liquid coming out the center of your fan, that's a very bad sign. We're also looking for excess clogging within the heatsink. If it hasn't been well looked after and it's had a pretty bad time trying to dissipate the heat because of all the crap that's inside. We're also looking for stuff like the warranty sticker right here. Has somebody gone through and actually modified the card in any way? But another thing that I tend to look for is stuff like this. This is a chunky thermal pad. And from our experience with chunky thermal pads, it typically means a thermal pad replacement on the card, which is weird because we still have the warranty intact sticker unless somebody 
just replace that too. Which is a good time to check any concerns against the teardown of your card. And it looks like Asus just used decent thermal pads, unlike what we saw with Marvin. And other than that, just a general overall condition. Has it been dropped? Are there any dents? Has it got any scratches on it? What is that sticker? But fortunately, we can have a bit of a deeper look inside this card. Hopefully you'll be able to see that on the overhead cam, but I'll highlight any issues that I find within it. And the first place that I typically like to start is the fans. What condition are they in? How much dust is actually in the grooves right here? And is there specifically any leaking? Leaking around the fan hub would typically indicate that the seal within the bearings is blown or on its way out and the fluid inside that actually lubricates the bearings is basically spilling on through and then the fun byproduct of that is that because it's attached to a fan just chops through all that liquid and scatters it everywhere it's horrible but fortunately enough I can't see any fluid and it's also a good opportunity for us to have a look through the heat sinks, which yeah, is a little bit dusty, but it's not really bad. And this view actually allows us to go through into the GPU and see a little bit further, which actually looks to be in pretty good condition, apart from maybe a spider that died. It's not a good sign. A minor mark here, not too big an issue, definitely sticker residue. So at this point, you could do a physical teardown of the card. You could take off the cooler, take off the back plate and see what condition the thermal pads are in and thermal paste for the core. But I really wouldn't want you to do anything that could affect your ability to return it. Similar to me, if you bought it on eBay and it has something like a warranty sticker or the seller would have taken photos of it before they sent it out, if I then do something like break through this warranty sticker and then I find out that the card is non-functional. That's a very easy case for the seller to be like, well, no, he opened it up and broke the card. Whether I did or didn't is a different matter. It's not about what's true, right? It's about what you can prove. And that would be very hard to dispute. So don't do anything at this point that is going to affect your ability to return the card. Now, I think it's time to give it a bit of a clean and get rid of that spider. Bear with me. Blowy, no. Go away. Shh. And once you're happy with it, it's time to stick it in a system and see if it boots. However, a quick but important side note here, if your rig already has an operating system installed and you have GPU drivers on it, especially if you're going from AMD to Nvidia or vice versa, I would highly recommend you run DDU on the system before plugging in the new use GPU. I have a link to that and any other software mentioned in this video in the description for you. But running DDU may not be possible right now. So you can continue on and do this once you're in the OS. And if you're installing a fresh operating system, you don't need to run DDU at all. But fortunately for us, I already have 3080 drivers on here, so should be fine. Which means that we get to test and lightly abuse this card to find any flaws. And here we go. We are in Windows, but this may not necessarily happen for you. So what do you do if there is no display? Well, assuming that the system was fully functional before adding the GPU, you're going to want to do two things. Reseat the graphics card back into the PCI slot and also reseat the power cables. If they haven't made a decent connection, that's likely going to fix it. But if you've done that and you still have no luck, remove the GPU from the system entirely and use the onboard display outs on your motherboard, provided that you have a CPU with integrated graphics. I'll drop a list below. Your next option would be to use a different graphics card or put your graphics card into a different system. If the computer works fine without your used GPU in it, but doesn't with, I would highly recommend returning the card at this point. Otherwise, I do want to do a couple of videos seeing if we can fix some dead graphics cards, so get subscribed for that. But for us, fortunately, we don't have to do that today. And we get to dive a little bit deeper. But before we do anything, we need to make sure that we are best set up to fully understand any issues that arise. If the system crashes, if there's any anomalies, we need to be in a position to understand the cause of them, which we can do. In fact, the best way to do this system wide is with Event Viewer. I won't get too much into this unless I have issues this will help with, but if you're crashing or blue screening, this is the place to go. And there are many resources online to help you understand it. But now it is time to test. And we are fundamentally testing three things fan issues, torture testing, and comparative performance. And I'll show you how to do this effectively and what to also look out for. 
And the first thing that we're going to do is a fan test. As you know, the fans are likely the first thing to go, and you want to make sure that there are no signs of issues. In this section, we are also going to go through how to log and graph your data properly, which will be necessary to understand for our performance testing later on. So you're going to need to first download the latest drivers for your card, then download two pieces of software that I typically recommend for any gaming system anyway, Hardware Info 64 and MSI Afterburner. And while installing MSI Afterburner, make sure that you install Reva Server 2. We will need that in a bit. And once you have them installed, open them up and set Hardware Info 64 to sensors only, which should bring you through to a screen pretty much like this. So let me talk you through how we're going to be doing our fan testing, what you need to be looking out for, and how to log the data appropriately. So starting out with the application on the left-hand side, this is MSI Afterburner. Now, Afterburner is actually a GPU overclocking utility, but how we're going to use it in the context of this test is to be able to set the fan speed on a fixed percentage, and then we can both log the data and observe it ourselves, which brings us onto Hardware Info 64. This is the application on the right-hand side. This allows us to do an extreme amount of data logging. So then we can see if we set it to 50% fan speed, is it holding a consistent 50% fan speed? Or is it dropping dramatically while it's trying to maintain that fixed speed? Because that would be a big red flag. And we're going to be most interested in GPU Fan 1 and GPU Fan 2, which you may already think is a little bit weird. We clearly have two results for GPU Fans in here, but three GPU Fans on our actual graphics card. And yours may even be set up completely different. Maybe one GPU Fan result in software, but two or three on the card. And the reason being is because there's two independent fan controllers on this graphics card. So if you're seeing something different in software compared to what you physically have in front of you, don't worry, that's not an issue. The only thing that you are going to do is make sure that your fans are synced right here, if you have that option. So what we're going to be doing is two tests. We're going to be doing a mid-speed fan test and a full-speed fan test. We're going to be doing them both for a prolonged period of time. I'll typically do between half an hour to an hour. So over to Hardware Info 64. We're going to reset minimum and maximum values and then start logging. What I'm going to do is just save it to my documents right here. And we can just name that fan speed test. Now, Hardware Info 64 has started its logging, which brings us back over to MSI Afterburner. What we're going to want to do is enable user-defined controls right here. And you may also need to turn that to off and then set this value up to 50% or you can type 50 into this box and apply it. So now that our fans are running at 50% fan speed, what we want to do is just take a little bit of a listen. Make sure that there's no grinding, scratching, anything that we mentioned earlier. So we'll listen to that now. Fantastic, that's exactly how it should sound. So what we're going to do at this point is leave it to run for about half an hour to an hour and then come back and crank up the fan speed. So let's do that. Okay, so now that it's been about 45 minutes, it still sounds fantastic. What we're going to do is crank up the fan speed. We'll make sure the Hardware Info 64 is still recording the data throughout this time period too. And then at the end of it, we'll gather the data, we'll graph it, and I'll show you what to look out for. So let's do that. Now we have gathered the data for our test. So as long as there were no weird noises from the fans, we can now gather the data, graph it, and have a look at any anomalies in the data. So let's do that now. What we're going to do is head over to the file that Hardware Info 64 created, the one that you specified earlier. We're then going to either open it in Excel if you have that installed on your computer, or you can just head over to Google Drive. And what we're going to do is place that CSV file in there, right click and open it with Google Sheets. Now, because it's a CSV file, what it's going to do is actually organize that in a spreadsheet format for us, like this. And what we can do is Control F, type in GPU Fan, and we have GPU Fan 1 and GPU Fan 2, as you saw in Hardware Info. So what we're going to do is take both of those columns and we're going to insert a chart right here. And you can see our mid-speed test and our full-speed test. But what we're going to do is change it over to a line graph, which gives us a better representation of the data and allows us to see any anomalies, which we have. Over here in our mid-speed fan test, you can see a pretty nice flat, even line, and the same going into our full-speed fan test. These little fluctuations in speed, they're absolutely fine. But the thing that is not fine is this massive dip right here which could indicate an issue with the fan where it might need replacing or for you to return the GPU. But the fortunate thing is I know why that happened and it's actually not an issue with the card. 
it's an issue with me. The one thing that I forgot to do is set my power and sleep settings right here in the window settings. And the computer did go to sleep during this test, which is why you're seeing that huge dip in RPM. So make sure that you set your sleep settings appropriately for the amount of time that you plan on running these tests. And otherwise you are good to go. So the pass fail criteria is as follows. Is a mid speed fan test a nice consistent flat line? which it is. And then moving up to the full speed fan test, is it also a nice but slightly less consistent flat line? Which it is, other than when the computer went to sleep. And on top of that, when we were running our tests, were the fans making any weird or abnormal noises? Grinding, scratching, anything like that. Which they weren't. But now it's time to move on to the more problematic stuff inside the card. Now, this is probably the most nerve wracking section. Is your card performing the way that it should? Luckily, we can use some more free applications to check this while also monitoring and comparing important metrics to see if your GPU is behaving as expected. But what is the expected behavior of your card in terms of stability and performance? Of course, the first thing that we need to do is make sure that it runs the torture test without producing errors, which especially with data logging is quite easy to check. Because a graphics card is a sensitive and complex device, failures are normally extremely obvious. You will typically see them as game crashes, the system blue screening, or as major anomalies in the game, like these artifacts that you're seeing now. And if it's not one of those, the system will likely shut down entirely. And I'll explain a little later on what to do if that happens. So before we get into the comparative performance, we need to start with stability and torture testing. As memory abuse for mining is going to be a top concern for most people, we're going to start by using two free applications to specifically test the memory. Remember links to all of these applications in the video description and make sure that you're using Hardware Info 64 to log the data for each of the tests, like I showed you in the fan testing section of this video. And make sure that you're close by so that you can periodically check on the system and make sure that the temperatures are okay. But that's a really good question actually. What are okay temperatures for your card? Well, let's find that out together and you can replace my card with yours in the search. This card is an RTX 3080. And like every other RTX 3080, they will all have the same max core operating temperature, regardless of this being the Asus Tough model. So Nvidia states that the maximum core temperature should be under 93 degrees for all 3080s, with a minimum clock speed of 1.44 gigahertz. And reviews of this specific model, the Asus Tough, have the GPU core at around the 60 degree mark when running stock. No overclock. Though I do need to stress that the 60 degree mark is very much a ballpark figure because of manufacturing tolerances, room temperature, and any thermal constraints of a case will impact that number. So don't be alarmed if yours is different compared to what you find online. And if you are using a case, keep the side panel off while testing. As for the memory temperatures, we can see that this card uses GDDR6X memory and should be kept under 105 degrees as per micron spec. But if your card uses GDDR6 memory, your upper limit should be 95. Though some cards may not report this temperature readout. But now that we know what we should expect, let's start out by resetting MSI Afterburner so that the card is running stock and launch GPU Memtest. This is going to be the quickest way to test your memory. All we need to do is start our data logging and hit run. Once that's completed, we would expect to see all tests okay in this text box right here. And if you need to investigate any issues, they can be retrieved by going to logs, then execution logs. And these are my results for Hardware Info 64. So let's compare what we have to what we would expect and make sure that you replace my numbers with the ones that you gathered for your card. We graph the memory junction temp, the core temp and the hotspot temp. But as this test focuses primarily on the memory, it inevitably shows a much lower core temp than the roughly 60 degree number that we gathered from reviews, which is expected. The memory junction temp was also well under the 105 degree mark as stated by Micron spec and the GPU hotspot well below 93 degrees as advised by Nvidia. A great result. The next memory test that we're going to do is OCCT's VRAM test, which can be accessed within the test tab and clicking here. I would also max out the memory usage, but because you're likely going to be using the free version of OCCT, currently you can only run the test for an hour. So let's start logging the data and run that test. Once that's complete, we would expect to see any issues displayed in this text box right here which we didn't get. And these are the Hardware Info 64 results for the VRAM test. It shows we are well within the numbers that we gathered before during our research. But as you can see in those results, our memory junction temperature is actually quite low during these tests, especially when compared to how hot they would get while mining. 
So at this point, I would also recommend following up with a day running NiceHash or another mining application. Normally, I wouldn't recommend mining for other reasons, but given that this is likely what your GPU was doing before you got it, I think it's important to do this for the sake of thorough testing and do this for a couple days nonstop while logging the data. The benefit for NiceHash here is that it swaps what it mines, which may also bring to light issues based on how it utilizes the GPU. But make sure that your temperatures are within spec, which will be defined by the manufacturer. But now that we're done with our memory tests, it's time to check out the actual graphics processor itself before comparing to real world performance. Which brings us back to OCCT. When you open it up, you'll want to head over to the test tab again, start logging the data and run the 3D standard test. At this point, because we're testing more than just the memory, depending on the GPU, you may hear buzzing and whining from the card during the test or while gaming. This is called coil whine and it's actually nothing to worry about. For context, this is how it sounds on the 3080 Tough before the fans spin up and make it inaudible. And my 3080 Founders Edition produces the most amount of coil wine, sounding like this. But once the OCCT 3D standard test completes, check there were no issues in the text box and that your temperatures are in check, which they were. And because we are now testing the core's performance, we also graphed GPU core clock to make sure that it's above the base clock for this card. Which brings us onto Fermark. Fermark is pretty damn abusive on a GPU and has no time limit. So it's a great way to test it. Start logging your data and run this test for a decent amount of time. I'm going to do five hours, but you may want to do a day or more. Any errors will be dumped into this log file right here for you. And these are my results from Hardware Info 64. Everything is looking really good. But as we aren't getting any errors in any of the application's log files, and there were no issues with crashing, blue screening, artifacting, or total system shutdowns, we get to lastly make sure that the gaming performance is as expected for this card. But if you were experiencing any issues, the best place to start is the log files for each of the applications and also Windows Event Viewer. However, if you are artifacting like this, unfortunately it's likely terminal and the card should be returned if you can. And if you are getting a total system shutdown, the first thing that I would do is make sure that your power supply has enough grunt to support the hardware it's trying to run. It's not always as simple as configuring the system on a power supply checker web app as initial spikes can trip over current protection, even if sustained power doesn't exceed the power supply spec. So Google any issues with your power supply and the card you're trying to run. But for us, we get to go to the final round. Are you meeting the performance you should expect? Well, there's a couple different ways to do this with pros and cons of each. The first thing that I would typically do is run something like the Unigen Superposition Benchmark and check your results against the leaderboard. Because it's a standard benchmark, you'll know that you are rendering the exact same frames as everyone else, which is perfect for comparative data. But the thing that you have to remember is that even if you filter, this leaderboard encompasses so many different configurations, overclocks, even the silicon lottery comes into play. And you have no idea if exotic calling was used to get a score much higher than you could realistically achieve. And that's pretty much the same with every benchmark leaderboard. But one of the reasons why I like Superposition so much is because it shows tons of detail relating to the system's configuration, allowing you to understand why a result might be higher than yours. For example, this is one of the highest RTX 3080 results on the leaderboard, but this system is very well optimized for ranking high. It uses 3800 mega transfer memory at CL14, and the GPU never got above 50 degrees even with an outrageous overclock. You are not going to be able to compete with this. So you need to better match the results you're looking at compared to your own system's components and clock speeds. It is not going to be on the first page. Another good way to do it is through the plethora of reviewers and game benchmarkers on YouTube that show a variety of different games running at different resolutions. You want to pick one that has the same GPU CPU combo that you do, match their graphics settings and clock speed. To increase your clock speed to match theirs, you want to adjust this slider in MSI Afterburner, but anything over the GPU's base clock is still considered an overclock clock and it's not guaranteed to be stable. Once you've done that, then find the exact point in the game that they are testing and compare. For real-time readouts like you see here, you would have already got this application when you followed the steps for installing MSI Afterburner during our fan testing, as Reva Statistics Server comes bundled by default. All you need to do is go into the Afterburner settings, go to the Monitor tab, and then click the Show in On-Screen Display checkbox for any of the things that you want to monitor live. And if you run into the issue of not being able to select the checkbox, just enable it by clicking on the tick on the left of what you want to monitor. But make sure that you're still logging the thermal data with Hardware Info 64 and compare it against 
against the numbers that you gathered at the start of this chapter. However, with this method, you will need to own at least one of the games that you're testing, and it can be very difficult to replicate the in-game actions of the benchmarker, unless a standardized benchmark was used within the game. There are also going to be variances even between two of the exact same system, so it may not be a precise FPS match, but it should be close provided that you're running at the same resolution, graphic settings, and clock speeds. And if you pass those tests without issue, the next thing that I would do is play around with overclocks using MSI Afterburner and rerun those tests. What overclock you should expect to achieve is very card dependent, and you'll need to look that up for yourself. So even though there's realistically no definitive way to know when or how a GP might die, passing all of these tests is an extremely good sign. A good sign that the card is strong and healthy like this guy. And I wish you and your new used GPU a long and happy life together. And if you want to know why GPUs are getting plentiful and cheap, you can learn more by checking out this video, where we broke down everything that happened during the infamous GPU crisis. Crypto, trade war, price gouging, even literal fire hazards delivered directly to your door. Even if you know the story, I bet you forgot a couple things and it's definitely worth a watch. So check that out by clicking here and remember guys, share, like, subscribe, they are always appreciated and I hope you have an amazing day.